First, I must say it's an honor to be back here at Christ Community Church. Mark Elstrand, you can call on me anytime. I know you had um, my dear friend Manny Mills here not too long ago, and I'm sure Manny said, Hallelujah! What a mighty God we serve. It's good to be here and to give God thanks and praise for who He is and what God wants to do. Now, I do not have to tell you that we are living in unprecedented times. We are living in challenging days, and many people are asking questions like, what happens next? How do we fix this? First, I must say, we're all praying for the family of George Floyd. We saw something horrible, something terrible on our television sets. And all we can do right now is pray and ask God to intervene. The question I've been asked is this, what is God saying to us right now? What is God saying about the coronavirus and also to the racial tension that we're facing right here in America? I believe God has a lot to say. So this morning, I'd like to go into that just a little bit. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that you're a God who hears and answers prayer. We thank you, Father God, that in spite of the turmoil, in spite of the confusion, that, Father God, you have something to say. So I'm going to ask you, Lord, right now to speak through me. Allow me to proclaim your word, Father God, with accuracy, excellence, and boldness, so that life will be transformed for your kingdom. In the mighty, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So what is the solution for racism, police brutality, and all the things we see going on in society today. I believe that those solutions can be found in the Bible. And in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 9, we find a very interesting story. A father brought his son to the disciples of Jesus and asked them to heal his son. The disciples tried, but they just could not heal the boy. Finally, Jesus shows up. Jesus heals the boy, and then the disciples came to Jesus in private and said, Lord, why could not we do this? Now pay close attention to what Jesus said. In Mark chapter 9, verse 29, And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Pay close attention to two words. Jesus said, this kind. What does that mean? That simply means that there are things you can be dealing with in life where you have tried everything and nothing seems to be working. And Jesus is saying to all of us, this kind can only be fixed a certain way. I believe Jesus is saying the same thing to us today. Racism, police brutality, the things that we're seeing can only be fixed one way, and that's through prayer and fasting. I also believe God is saying to us, we need to take a closer look at 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. We have heard that verse many, many times. 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14 says, If my people who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. We have heard that verse many, many times. But after closer examination, I believe we might find some truth in this verse we never saw before. Let's take time to unpack this verse. First, the verse says, if. Whenever we see the word if, this simply means whatever follows the if is conditional. And God is saying to us, if my people, notice God did not say the entire world. He said, my people, who are God's people? The church, the true church. God is talking to us. And God is saying, if my people who are called by my name shall do a few things. Humble themselves, pray, seek.
seek his face and turn from their wicked ways then. God is saying, after we do these things, then God says, I will hear from heaven. God goes on, I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. So God is saying, do you want your land to be healed? And we all say, yes, God. Then God is saying, do it my way. Humble yourselves, pray, and ask me to intervene. And I will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sins, and I will heal the land. You see, friends, this morning, God is asking us to pray like we have never prayed before. God is also asking us to become his ambassador. You know, my hero is known in heaven, my earthly hero was Dr. Billy Graham. Everyone knows how much I love, appreciated Dr. Billy Graham and his ministry. And in the year 1989, I met Dr. Howard Jones, who was one of Billy Graham's ministers, and he introduced me to the Graham Association, one of the greatest decisions I ever made. Went around the world with the Graham Association, and it truly changed my life. But once I was in Ohio at Dr. Jones' home with his wife, and Dr. And Mrs. Jones told me a story that I never forgot. He said to me, Huntley, many years ago, the entire team from the Billy Graham Association went to Europe on a crusade. They call them festivals now. It was crusade at the time. And he said, when we got there, they allowed the entire team to check into the hotel, except myself and Dr. Ralph Bell, another friend, simply because of the color of their skin they would not allow them to check into the hotel. Dr. Graham was not there at the time. By the time Dr. Graham got there and he discovered what happened, he pulled the entire team from the hotel. By this time, the manager was apologizing profusely, but Billy Graham said to the manager, you do not understand. I do not have a white team and a black team. I have one team. And whenever I go, wherever I go, my team goes with me. And when Dr. Jones and his wife told me the story, I said, wow, that is God's ambassador. Billy Graham went down south in, in America, held integrated meetings at a time when it was not popular. He went to South Africa during the time of apartheid and held integrated meetings. Why? Because he was God's ambassador. God is asking the same thing of us today. God is saying to the church, will you be my ambassador? Here's what an ambassador does. In 1 Kings chapter 22, we see another wonderful example. 1 Kings 22 verses 13 to 14 says, The messenger who had gone to summon Micaiah said to him, Look, the other prophets without exception are predicting success for the king. Let your word agree with theirs and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, as surely as the Lord lives, I can tell him only what the Lord tells me. That is what an ambassador does. That is what true Christians do. As true Christians, we do not go with the popular grain. We do not say what everyone else says. We simply say what God says. And God says racism is a sin and we need to do the same. We also must realize that when God calls us, we must obey. Why? Because obedience is time sensitive. Write that down. Obedience is time sensitive. Now, a few years ago, I heard a story from a pastor friend of mine. On his way to church, he said, the Lord spoke to him about talking to his neighbor. And he said, God, I do not have time to speak to my neighbor. I have to go and preach. I will be late for church. So what did he do? He ran to church. He preached his sermon. And he went back home. When he got back home, when he got to the neighborhood, he saw the police car, the ambulance, and the yellow tape. His neighbor had died. And he said to me, it took me a long time to forgive myself. Because I knew God spoke to me. 
and I did not obey. Is God speaking to you right now? What is God saying to you? You see, my friend did not obey the Lord, and we give God thanks for grace and for mercy. But we have to remember obedience is time sensitive. About two weeks ago, I was pondering the thought about obedience being time sensitive. I was going shopping. I was on Randall Road heading towards Batavia. And I passed this lady on the street, and she was painting a cross. And in my spirit, I felt the Lord say to me, why don't you just stop and pray for her? And I'm like, Lord, I got to get to the grocery store. I cannot stop. We're in a time of racial tensions. This is a Caucasian lady. I'm a black guy. You know, God, we don't know. So I went to the store. But then I got convicted. Huntley, if you're truly my ambassador, you are going to obey me. So on the way back, I said, well, if the lady is there, I'm going to stop and I'm going to pray with her. On the way back, she was there. So I pulled up behind her and I said, ma'am, you do not know me, but can I just pray for you? She said, oh, please, yes, that would be wonderful. And before I prayed, I said, can you tell me what happened here? She said, well, my son's name is Tim. He was coming back one night and a Comcast truck, I think, got out of control, hit him and killed him. And she came to the spot to paint a cross in memory of her son. Now, I do not know anything about this lady. Never met her before. Have not seen her since. I do not know if she was in a time in her life where she said, I am giving up. I am done. And this is it. I don't know. One thing I do know, God spoke to me and asked me to pray for her. And I believe God is saying the same for all of us. Will you obey me when I speak to you? Because obedience is time sensitive. And I believe in the season that we're in, God is saying to all of us, to the church, you need to cause, let your voices be heard. You need to cause change. And let people know that yes, racism is a sin, but you can find true peace in a relationship with me. What is this God is saying? What else is God saying? People are saying to me over and over, Huntley, talk to me. What else is God saying about the time we're living in? God is saying, I am looking for true worshipers. I am looking for true worshipers. And why is this important? Folks, there is something amazing about worship that gets God's attention. When we give God the kind of worship that he desires, he will show up right into our situations and change whatever we are dealing with. But I discovered not everyone is worshiping God the way God wants us to worship him. Now look at this very troubling passage. Matthew 15, verses 8 to 9 says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. What is God saying here? He's saying there, could, there can be many people worshiping God, raising hands, saying hallelujah, doing all the things that seem like they're truly worshiping God. And God is saying, these people are simply honoring me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And this part is very scary. Scripture says, they worship me in vain. This morning, we do not want to worship God in vain. We want to give God the kind of worship he desires so God can come and dwell in our praise and transform our situation. So in order to give God the kind of worship he desires, we need to study worshipers. And this morning, I would like to introduce you to a true worshiper in scripture by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. He was a true worshiper. I can see a few people saying, Huntley, say that once more. Are you talking about King Nebuchadnezzar, a true worshiper? Yes, King Nebuchadnezzar was a true worshiper. Let us examine his journey. And in examining Nebuchadnezzar's journey, here's what we discovered. He had what we call 
and no eye moment. The question for you this morning is, have you had your no eye moment? In order for Nebuchadnezzar to become a true worshiper, he had to have a no eye moment. And the question is, what did it take for Nebuchadnezzar to have his no eye moment? Let's examine his story. In the book of Daniel, chapter 4, verse 34, Daniel 4, verse 34 says this, At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Now listen to Daniel 4, verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. Nebuchadnezzar said, now I worship God and listen to the language he used. He said, now I praise and exalt and glorify Nebuchadnezzar sounds like he'd been to Judson University and studied in the worship arts class. Nebuchadnezzar is using worship language. But what did it take to get Nebuchadnezzar to have his now I moment? What will it take for you to have your now I moment? Let's look at Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 or 3. Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 says, In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. You see, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that literally scared him. He knew that this was not a normal dream. Have you had any dreams lately? Do not discount your dreams. Your dreams could be God talking to you. In the case of Nebuchadnezzar, he knew this was a profound dream. He just could not understand what he was seeing. He called in all wise men. And he told him the problem. The wise men said to him, well, Nebuchadnezzar, tell us the dream and we will interpret it for you. But he said, no, I am not going to tell you what I dreamt. You tell me what I dreamt and then interpret it. All the wise men were so shocked with what they heard. Listen to what they said. The astrologers answered the king, Daniel chapter 2, verse 10 to 12. There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. When the king, what the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods and they do not live among humans. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar got so angry because they could not tell him what he dreamt. He said, kill all the wise men. Daniel was a wise man. And they went to execute Daniel. And when they got to Daniel, Daniel said, okay, give me time and I will get the interpretation for you. The executioner said, okay, we'll give you a little time. So Daniel went immediately to his friends. To ask them to pray. My question to you this morning is, who are the friends in your life that you can call upon to pray for you? Who is praying for you right now? We're in a very difficult season and we need people to be praying for all of us. But we must be praying for other people as well. So what did Daniel do? He called on his friends. He said, guys, please, let's go to prayer right now and ask God to share with us the dream and the interpretation. God gave Daniel the interpretation. 
And then he went back to Nebuchadnezzar, told him exactly what he dreamt, and gave him the interpretation. And Nebuchadnezzar said, oh yes, this is exactly what I dreamt, and you are right. What a wonderful experience. After an experience like that, you would think Nebuchadnezzar would have his now I moment. But he didn't. What is it going to take for you to have your now I moment? Nebuchadnezzar went about business as usual. And look what he did. He built a statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. And he commanded everyone in his country to worship the statue. Daniel's friends, Chadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to Nebuchadnezzar, You know, king, there are things that we can do. This one we cannot. Why? Because for us, this is a non-negotiable. What are the non-negotiables in your life? Is there anything in your life that will cause you to say, no matter what laws are passed, no matter if it's popular, no matter if everyone is saying the same thing, I will never compromise on this because this for me is a non-negotiable. You need a few non-negotiables in your life. When Nebuchadnezzar discovered this was a non-negotiable for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he got angry. I can see Nebuchadnezzar saying, what? What? I can see steam coming out of his head. He said, heat the furnace seven times hotter and throw them into the furnace. And they did. But God showed up. And they did not burn. And Nebuchadnezzar jumped to his feet in amazement. And he said, didn't we throw three guys into the furnace? How do I see four? And the fourth looked like a son of the gods. And he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come here. And they came out. There was not even a smell of smoke on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I can only imagine what happened when Nebuchadnezzar got home to talk to his wife about what he saw and experienced that day. That must have been a profound experience and we would all think after seeing something of this magnitude nebuchadnezzar would have his no eye moment but he didn't what is it going to take for you to have your no eye moment what is it going to take for america to turn back to god we are going to bow now or we are going to bow later, but we are going to repent sooner or later. The question is, what is it going to take? This did not move Nebuchadnezzar. He went about business as usual. Finally, Nebuchadnezzar had another dream. This dream also scared him. So he called in Daniel. Daniel, I am concerned about this dream. So he told Daniel the dream, and Daniel got afraid. And Daniel said, Your Majesty, if this dream was about your enemies, I could understand. But this dream is about you. And then Daniel said this, Your Majesty, let me give you my advice. Listen to this verse. Daniel chapter 4, verse 27. Daniel 4 verse 27 says this, Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. We are all called upon to give advice. What is your advice in this season that we're in. Everyone is looking for answers. What's your advice for racism? What's your advice for police brutality? What's your advice for people who are doing the wrong things by looting? What's our advice? My advice is do the right thing. Come to God on his terms 
Ask God to forgive you. Ask God to step into the situation. Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. After something like this, as profound as this, you'd think by this time, Nebuchadnezzar would say, okay, yes, I do understand now. I'm going to worship God. I now have my no eye moment. Not Nebuchadnezzar. He kept going on as if nothing had happened. And one year later, exactly what was prophesied about him came to pass. Listen to Daniel chapter 4, verse 33. Daniel 4, verse 33 says, Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claw of a bird. After that experience was over, now Nebuchadnezzar had his now I moment. Daniel 4, verse 37. Now I, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Friends, have you had your now I moment? What is it going to take for the church, the world at large, to have our now I moment? Here's the news, folks, this morning. We are going to have a now I moment. The scripture says, at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're going to bow now or we're going to bow later, but we're going to bow. The question is, what is it going to take for us to have our now I moment? In closing, can God call on you this morning to be obedient? I know delivering a word like this is not a popular word. It's a tough word to give. But I must walk in obedience to what God has placed in my heart. Can God count on you to pray? Because we're dealing with uh, this kind of situation. Can God call upon you to be his ambassador? Can God call upon you to become a true worshiper? Can God count on you to say to all your friends and family, have you had your no I moment? And can God count on you to meditate and to practice what we read in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. Let's end with that verse once more. 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. If, if, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will, God is saying, I will forgive our sins. And here's the good news. I will heal your land. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that God, though the day gets dark and tough and people are asking questions, Father God, what's next? Lord, we thank you, God, that the answer is found in you. So here we are, Lord, to humble ourselves, to say to you, God, we know, God, we have messed up. We know, Father God, we have not worshipped you the way you want to be worshipped. And Father God, we know, Lord, we have not been kind to our fellow man. So God, we're going to ask you to forgive us. We're going to ask you, Father God, to step right into this situation. God, allow the church to step up to the plate and to lead. You're calling us at this difficult time in world history to lead. So here we are, Lord. Anoint us. Bless us. 
Use us for your glory. And we give you thanks, praise, glory, and honor in the mighty, powerful name. The name that is above every other name. The name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you.